Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Haunt Collection Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Codina. And, um, hey, was halfway through recording this episode when I realized I wasn't drinking water. I was drinking Diet Mountain Dew. So, like, it was just nothing but mouth noises and pops and clicks and stuff like that. So I'm restarting so you don't have to listen to all the, uh, you know, whatever popping noises and coming from my mouth. Uh, you didn't need to know that, but I told you anyways, because I don't have too much else to talk about before this, uh, before the story. Speaking of the story, um, I saw this posted somewhere else, and I was just going to read it, and I was like, hey, I needed something to read for, uh, the Haunt Collection, so I'm gonna hold on to it, and I'll read it when I record. Um, we're diving back into No Sleep. Uh, this was posted relatively recently, um, four days ago as of this recording. Uh, only 21 upvotes, um, but, you know, as we saw last week, upvotes don't mean too much. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, yeah, we'll see, uh, this might be, uh, you know, a hidden gem. It is called A Night at the Phone Bank by Reddit user Max underscore Every. Uh, as usual, I'll link it in the description so you can check it out, read along, and all that. Um, it's about it, I think, so, uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. Anyone who's ever worked a phone bank probably has some experience calling the wrong person at the wrong time. But believe me when I tell you that it's nothing compared to the experience I had in the fall of 2015. I'm currently a senior at Northern Virginia High School, and last year when I was a junior, my AP government teacher told us that one of her students, a girl named Karina, had a mom who was running as a Democrat in a local election to be on the County Board of Supervisors. That's um, it's the second time I've read that sentence, and I don't think it's, like, grammatically a run-on, but it feels really long. Like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's fine, but it just feels long. The teacher offered extra credit to anyone who volunteered 12 or more hours with the campaign, so I jumped on. Now, before you cast partisan judgment on me, just know I consider myself completely politically apathetic and couldn't even tell you what a county board of supervisors does if you put a gun to my head. Democrats and Republicans notwithstanding, this was a purely mercenary chance to boost my GPA with college applications just around the corner. Darn centrists. Pick a side. <laughs> Karina signed me up for an evening slot on a phone bank pestering local registered voters while they were eating dinner, watching TV, and whatnot. I had my mom drop me off at 5 p.m. before her night shift as a nurse at the nearby county hospital and told her I would try to get a ride back with one of my classmates. The phone bank was in this nondescript two-story brick building off an unlit wood road about half a mile from anything of note in our neighborhood. With its tinted windows and a lack of signage, it was exactly the kind of place you would expect some sketchy telemarketing to go down. After ringing the bell, they buzzed me in, and I walked up to the second floor. An overweight, depressed-looking campaign guy with bags under his eyes named Peter met me, and took me inside the call center. A few other kids from my class were there, including Karina, of course, as well as some older volunteers, maybe eight or nine altogether. Not a huge turnout. There were three or four long fold-out tables with six phones per table, although Peter informed us we wouldn't actually be using any of them. Okay, so, uh, not too much to sink our teeth into yet. We're mostly just, um, setting the scene, which is, uh, which is good. Yeah, I don't really have too much to say about it yet. Let's, uh, let's continue and see, uh, see what's next. Nowadays, political campaigns use a call routing service that automatically lines up who we talk to electronically. We sign into the service on our laptops or tablets, and it connects to our personal cell phones anonymously to our next victim, so to speak. A queue of names and numbers of registered voters is on our screens next to a pre-prepared script, which went something like this. Hi, is blank available? My name is blank, and I'm a volunteer with the Virginia Democratic Party. Do you support blank for County Board of Supervisors? If yes, that's great. Blank will fight for the working families of our community and put Virginia first. If no, okay. If maybe, unsure, undecided... Okay, I understand. Just so you know, I'm supporting blank because I believe our county board needs to blah blah, etc, etc. After each call ended, there was a quick form we had to fill out to record if the person we talked to pledged to vote for our lady. Yes, no, maybe. 
And if there was uh, no response, we had to choose from several options. Voicemail, refused, callback, wrong number, or disconnected, deceased, or language barrier. Hmm. Okay, so um, we're still setting this up, but I uh, I hope we're getting this information for a reason. Um, it's the person who posted this said this was based on a real experience they had working at a phone bank. So um, obviously they know what's going on, and this certainly adds to the plausibility um, of the story that like these are real details of how this stuff works. And details are always good, but um, hopefully these, you know, have a meaning later and it isn't just, you know, uh, oh yeah, this is how the phone bay works and, you know, doesn't matter, here's the spooky thing. You know, we'll, uh, we'll see. It's just something that's sticking out to me is we're getting a lot of information and I, uh, I hope it applies to what comes next. As soon as I connected to the routing service and started making calls... I found that most of the numbers it was dialing for me fell under the wrong number or disconnected umbrella. Sometimes it would be that screechy fax machine dial tone, or I'd wind up calling a law office or CVS pharmacy or something. If I learned anything, it's that voter registration lists are outdated as hell. The folks I did wind up chatting with were overall pretty friendly, or at least put on a polite front to my intrusive canvassing. One of my favorites told me to hold on, put the phone down, and yelled, Candace, there's a white boy on the phone for you. Another guy decided to be a prankster, and after my initial, I'm a volunteer with the Virginia Democratic Party, went to into a faux evil villain laugh. <laughs> ah, I'm a Republican that hung up. I have to admit, it made me chuckle. Okay. <laughs> Once I got into a groove, the time went by, only stopping occasionally to use the bathroom or grab a Diet Coke from the fridge. About three hours into what was supposed to be a four-hour session, my classmates decided to bail. I felt bad for Peter, since there were only a couple of people left doing the phone banking. Plus, I needed the hours. I asked Peter if he could give me a lift home if I stayed until 9pm, and it seemed to make his day. So I told my friends to split, and I'd see them in class. A few of them made some homoerotic gestures directed at Peter. I just laughed it off. Sounds like friends are jerks. Jeez. And I'm curious what the homoerotic gestures are. Was it like the, you know, the, oh, 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 I don't know. I don't know. You didn't see that because this is a gesture. But uh, maybe by the, uh, by the sound you got it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyway. Pulling one last Diet Coke from the fridge, I hunkered down from 60 more minutes of calls. By 8.30, it was just myself and Peter doing the dialing and our tones were starting to sound pretty robotic at this point. There's only so many ways to read the same boring script with gusto. I like the word gusto. It's good. I like the story. No matter what happens, I like the story because I use the word gusto. Around 8.35, the cue on the tablet screen said it was dialing a number for a Greg Stokes. I launched it to my usual spiel. Hi, I'm a volunteer with the Virginia Democratic Party. Is Greg Stokes available? No reply. Labored breathing could be heard. Like the man on the other end was running. Then, after a few moments, a piercing, high-pitched male voice with a crack to it came through. The man sounded confused and winded, as if had just been punched in the solar plexus. Can you help me? I'm very weak, the man struggled to say. I'm sorry? Do you need help, sir? I replied. Weak. I'm very weak. I need help, he wheezed out. Mr. Stokes? Is this Greg Stokes? Where are you right now, sir? I asked, my heart beginning to race. Do you need me to call an ambulance? They're coming. For him, he gasped. Is someone chasing you, sir? I asked. By this point, Peter had turned around and noticed the air of panic in my current call. He held a finger up to let me know he'd be off his own call in a minute. Not me. Him. They know... What I did, the man enigmatically uttered. Um, so the uh, the way they're structuring uh, Mr. Stokes' sentences, it's like there's a period between the words, um, which is, I get, you know, it's supposed to be pauses, but it's sort of like throwing me off that it's like these individual sentences and uh, 
instead of like ellipses or whatever. Um, although ellipses are often abused, so uh, maybe it's a good call that they weren't used here. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it's a bothering me the uh, just the not me him. You know, it's uh, you know it just reading it the way my eyes see it. I don't like it. Um, not the greatest defense, just, you know, a personal thing. It's just, yeah. Anyways. <clears throat> what did you do, Mr. Stokes? Are you in danger? I continued to probe. I stole it. I stole it, he said, getting more agitated from Quantico. I stole, moved it with my hand. I can move things with my mind. I hid it in the woods. Hmm. I wasn't expecting this to potentially have a uh, supernatural or um, what is uh, mental powers fall under? Preternatural. I think preternatural is like telepathy, telekinesis, and all that. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, we'll uh, let's see. Uh, let's see what happens next before I say any more on that. At this point, I relaxed because I knew this had to be some kind of sick prank. Quantico was clearly referring to the well-known Marine Corps base, located not too far from where I lived. But then the stuff about him moving stuff with his mind was just ridiculous. Okay, guy, that's a good one. Ha ha, I fake laughed. You can move stuff with your mind. This is the end of my shift, so I'm gonna hang up now, okay? I heard nothing from the other end except his labored breathing. I'm hanging up, Mr. Stokes, okay? I repeated. Thank you for supporting the Virginia Democratic Party. Suddenly, my tablet on the table moved independently, about six inches in one direction, knocking over my coke. Then six inches in another direction. I jumped in my seat. I'm really close. Soon. You'll see me. Please. Help. He squealed before disconnecting. I felt all the blood drain from my face. Peter hung up with the person he was on with and approached me. You get a wily one? Peter asked, sensing my panic. Just calm down. Tell me what happened. I hadn't realized I was breathing rapidly. My first instinct was to rush over to the window that shone out the small parking lot in front. Peter nudged in next to me to look out the window as well. It was dark out. Nothing but trees and Peter's Honda illuminated by the building's external lights. Without taking my eyes off the entrance, I explained that there might be a disturbed person heading to our building. Without missing a beat, Peter called 911 and told him to send a squad car to our location. As he stayed on the line with the operator, I noticed the figure of a tall blonde man, about 40 years old and wearing a dirty collared shirt and jeans, hobbling quickly through the entrance and into the parking lot. How did he locate us? He stopped momentarily, and his eyes fixed to me in the window. As soon as my eyes met the man's, the power to the building shut off, leaving Peter and I in utter darkness. Peter's cell phone had died as well. Not just lost connection with 911, the whole phone had lost power. The police were already on their way, though. This definitely isn't going where I expected, and I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like the, um, the whole phone bank introduction thing could have led to some, like, really, um, interesting realist horror, but now we're getting this whole guy with mind powers in the you know, like, robbing stuff from the feds. A uh, guy with mind powers on the run just randomly answering a phone from, you know, uh, what I would assume is an unknown number. Um, so I'm kind of scratching my head at this at the moment, but uh, let's see how it plays out. We heard the glass doors downstairs shatter and footsteps outside our floor. Neither of us moved. At the opposite end of the dark room, the door opened and a figure walked towards us with great deliberation. Peter picked up a chair and started swinging at the shadowy figure, but the tall man grabbed him by the throat and threw him to the floor. A small bellow came from Peter before his head cracked against the ground, then nothing. Running on adrenaline, I rushed towards the figure and plowed into him with all my body weight, slamming him to the floor. I felt his chest give way immediately under my weight, as if his bones were made of styrofoam. No sound, no breathing, nothing. The man switched off as quickly as he'd turn off our power, if he had indeed done that with his mind. 
I heard police sirens and saw flashes of blue and red pour through the window. It illuminated the face of the unidentified man underneath me, whose skin looked taut, utterly pale, and almost decomposed on close inspection. It was as if Greg had been dead for a week or more. I turned to see Peter on the floor next to me, also not breathing. His throat was one massive bruise. Man, this story really went in a way I wasn't expected. Uh, which isn't great analysis on my part. I'm just sort of like grasping here, trying to see what uh, where this is going to go. It was only days later that I tried to contemplate how a man like the Greg creature, who was so completely weak, whose bones shattered nearly in contact, could have crushed Peter's windpipe in less than a second. At least that's my perception of what happened, since I fled the scene only a few moments after examining both bodies. I ran down and met the two police vehicles in the parking lot, explained to them as best I could the situation, and watched as a pair of them went up to the second floor. About a half hour later was when the first unmarked FBI vehicles showed up, followed by a second and third and, well, I lost count after a while. There were at least six or seven black sedans parked in the lot down the wooded street leading in. Not to mention the ambulance. I asked one of the suited men why there weren't two ambulances, and they said that only one body had been on the second floor. The man was later identified as Gregory William Stokes, a local antique dealer who hadn't been seen since a day or two before his vehicle was recovered in the woods two miles outside of Quantico Marine Corps Base. I obviously have no clue what happened to Peter, and never even heard his name brought up in the news reports about the incident in the days that followed. Karina's mother's campaign acknowledged that a man named Peter had worked for them, but could not account for his whereabouts after that night, stating that he had resigned from the campaign. I didn't even know his last name. I was barely questioned by authorities, and had little to tell my parents or classmates beyond the boilerplate explanation that had been given to me. That a vagrant had broken into the phone bank, and I had subdued him. All the counseling in the world couldn't help me shake the thought of Peter laying there dead one minute, then vanished into thin air the next. I often wonder if whatever entity controlling his human shell is out ambling through the woods, using that item as supposedly stole from the base, whose purpose I couldn't even begin to speculate on. Stole with its mind. In a way, the only real closure I got from this whole incident was the next afternoon when I was at home on a sick day from school with my mom lounging around in a sort of stupor. I pulled my tablet out, turned it on, and realized I had never logged out of the campaign's call rerouting service. Fifteen hours after my call with whatever Greg Stotes was, the post-call questionnaire screen was still up. Under the no response section, I checked off, deceased. So I actually, I like that little ending that, you know, um, <laughs> maybe it's, uh, it's my own, like, thing with no sleep is that I always expect there to be, and now he's coming for me, you know, that kind of thing. So I like this sort of, um, I don't want to say non-ending, but it's just sort of like, you know, I don't know what happened, check the cease on the thing. Uh, so that kind of makes all the, the details beforehand worth it, just for that little last line, I like that. As for the, um, the story overall, like I said, it's kind of leaving me scratching my head. I feel like it's so out there. Um, there's definitely, like, the plausibility that this person knew it was up uh, as far as phone banks worked. But then this whole thing about somebody stealing something from Quantico and they have telekinesis and they're squishy bones and I don't know. Um, and they might be still alive. I, it's... I, I don't love it. Um... Because, like I said, it's just sort of like, what? It, you know, um, writing-wise, it's um, it seems solid to me. I didn't really notice too many, uh, much in the way of, like, mistakes or anything like that. Um, it's just, yeah, like, this, this story is just, it's, it's, it's the best way I can describe it. It's a head-scratcher. It's kind of like, you know, what, what happened? Um, there's only three comments. Let me look at what the comments say. I'm just uh, curious what the, there's... There's one that's really a long one. That man was possessed, or was just a ghost in the form of the dead Greg, because he had inhuman powers, like moving things with his minds. Not only that, but moving things that are miles far from him. Besides, that the strength he had to throw a big guy like Peter very fast. Space, period, space. 
I don't think it was human. I think it killed Greg, then killed Peter. But why the FBI came to investigate, and why did they cover up what happened to Peter? You went down with two dead men upstairs, but they said it only one. I think FBI and the police know something. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. And I don't think that Peter just disappeared as they told, but they lied to you. But why? <laughs> That's the fun thing about No Sleep, is when you get these people who are super into the stories, and I, I'm not being facetious, I love that people, like, write their own lore in the comments, it cracks me up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun to get into the whole RP, you know, aspect of No Sleep. Um, there are two comments... As someone who is currently phone banking in a local state and a local election, this terrifies me. <laughs> I ship you and Peter. May he come back to life and be united with you. Oh boy, that's a that's about as unexpected as um the the turn this story took. I ship you and Peter, they said. Oh boy. Um Yeah. Uh like I said, I don't know if I don't want to say it's a bad story. Um, it's a little different. Um, I like the whole, the, the, you know, the Greg Stokes character, like the whole, like, oh, he's strong enough to lift a grown man by his throat and crush his windpipe and all that. But he's also, you know, a squishy man. He's, uh, you know, he gets tackled by a junior in high school and he just smooshes. Um, that's a pretty cool detail. I like that. Um, and it does make you guess, like, well, you know, it leaves you guessing, like, you know, what is that? What does that mean? But, um, overall, yeah, like I said, it's just sort of like, it seems out of nowhere and not in a way that is satisfying to me. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's what, that's the best thing I can think of. It's the... Although I guess maybe um, in a way that's sort of like the uh, classic creepypasta thing is sort of like, here's this weird thing that happened. Um, yeah, it it just feels, um, it just feels strange and I'm confused, which isn't great. Yeah, it just, it kind of just leaves me wondering in the bad way, you know, it's, uh, it just feels so, like I said, it feels out of nowhere. I'm just kind of, like, blindsided by this whole, you know, experiment thing, I guess. Like, I had escaped the experiment. I don't know. Like, you know, I obviously they're trying to leave, you know, some questions open. What did he steal? What was he? You know, what happened to the body and all that? Um, you know, which is great. Like I've always said, you know, restraint is good. But, yeah, this, the whole... It's like I said, it's, I keep saying that, it's like the best thing I could say, it's a head scratcher. It's, you know, like, where did this come from? Um, yeah, I was, I was hoping this went in more of a realist direction. It felt like it was going that way. And then it just, it really just kind of, you know, went off the rails. And, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's an interesting one, but... Like I said, I don't know if I can say that I like it. I don't know if I can say that it's bad, necessarily, but I don't know if I can say if I like it either. Um, yeah, like, I keep, you know, one thing I keep thinking about it, that's that's, that's uh, positive, right? I just keep thinking, like, how do I feel about this story? Uh, yeah, hmm. So that's, uh, that is... A Night at the Phone Bank by Max underscore Every. Um, like I said, check out it for yourself. I'm curious to know what you guys think about it. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's going to be it. I don't really have too much more to say on this. Hmm. That's, that's what I have to say is. Hmm. So um, that's, uh, that's going to be it for this week. Uh, you know the usual. Like, share, subscribe, all this. Share with your friends. You know, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, please do. Let's, uh, let's get some more ears on here. Let's see what, I don't know, uh, what people think of these stories that I'm reading and all that, and what people think of what I think of these stories. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I think that's it. 
So uh, until uh, until next time, uh, later. <laughs> <laughs>